We're in Acts chapter 13, talking about the first missionary journey that they had uh, had out. Remember what was happening in Jerusalem. The persecution became so heavy there that they couldn't even gather as the church. So God was using that persecution because, as remember, there in Acts chapter 1, the the ministry of the gospel was going, first of all, was going to go where? To Jerusalem. Then Judea, Samaria, and then the outermost parts of the world. But of course, when you get comfortable in life, you don't necessarily want to move. You don't want to change. I don't like change in my life in any way or anyhow. But yet persecution brought them to a place where they were forced out of Jerusalem and they started going out to the outermost parts of the world. As we look at verse 1, it says, Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, uh, Simeon, who was, called, uh, who was called Niger, Lucia of uh, Cyrenian, and Mania, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrat and Saul. Isn't it interesting as we look at, even in verse 1, these various uh, backgrounds that made up the early church there? Just even as we have a various background here at Agape Chapel, people from all different places. And, you know, and yeah, I would love to have you all come up and tell your story of where you were born, where you came from, and, you know, where you went to high school and all that. It'd be fun to be able to hear all that. Barnabas was a Jew. We know that from the scriptures. Simeon, who's also known as Simon. Some would thought, remember the fellow that carried the cross of Jesus on the, uh, on the, the, there right before, you know, uh, he went to the cross, he was crucified? Well, apparently this is the guy that we're talking about that came from Africa. And so he was still, still around there in the early church. And then Lucia was from uh, the area of Crete or, you know, Crete or whatever they call it there in the northern part of Africa. And then this fellow, Menea, was the boyhood friend of Herod Antipius, otherwise uh, the Herod who executed John the Baptist. He was, he was the uh, aristocratic connection that we have. So not only have a different in social class, but also different places where people had come, was there at the early church gathering to do the work that God had given them to do. Of course, it mentions also that Saul was there making that, you know, this group of people here. And it tells us in verse 2, it opens up and says, says, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work which I've called them. I, when you think of ministry, normally you think it's a ministry to the congregation. You know, I'm a minister, you know, as I go out and teach. And, and you probably think, well, Pastor Terry is the minister at Agape Chapel. But I find it's interesting here that they minister to the Lord. This truly is the primary function, I believe, of all believers, why God has called us, is that we, as a church, that we would minister unto the Lord in our worship and the things that we do. You know, God created us for his glory. And we could never, ever be in a better spot in our entire life and that when we're, we're spending our time and our energy worshiping God and doing what God has called us to do, I know that I, I'm so blessed during the week as I'm giving thanks, as I'm praising him, and as I'm talking about him, and as I'm listening to him, you know, and as we minister unto the Lord, it refreshes us, and it, it, it fills our heart. You know, there's a, a beauty uh, during the week, it's just to minister unto the Lord as we come into church, as we're ministering unto the Lord. Paul wrote in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 12, he says, we should be to the praise of his glory. What our life should be is that what blesses God in all that we do. You know, and you might say, Terry, how does that work? Well, Paul writes in the book uh, of Ephesians, and no, book of Colossians, he says, and whatsoever you do, do wholeheartedly unto the Lord and not the men. It means whatever I'm doing during, during the week blesses God as I do it unto him. It could be at my workplace. It could be you know, in my home life. It could be even cooking turkeys. You know, I was uh, lifting these big old turkeys, carving it up, and there was a song in my heart, just enjoy looking forward to tonight as I was doing that. But the result of this 
ministering to the, unto the Lord is overflowing. And that's where real true ministry is, as you minister unto the Lord. It, it, like it overflows as I'm standing here, here with you this morning is because of my relationship with Jesus is my time with the Lord. It overflows as you spend time with the Lord. It overflows unto the people that God brings you uh, into contact with. He says, you know, Timothy tells us in 2 Timothy 2.6, the hardworking farmer must first take part of the crops. A hardworking farmer needs to go out there and really spend time tilling the soil and do everything that he's doing in order to reap the harvest. Our, our good friend, Pastor Bill, he's, of course, he's up there on that farm in Colorado. For him to just to harvest his first crop here this fall, he had to go out and do all the hard work that needed to be done first. And it's kind of like our time with the Lord. We need to spend time with the Lord before we're able to pass it on. Sort of like measles. You can't give them unless you got them, right? And, and you have to have that work of God within your heart before you minister unto others. So the first thing that we see them doing in verse 2 is that they were ministering to the Lord. And then secondly, it says that they fasted. It's interesting. It's something that you don't necessarily see or hear in, in churches today, today is people spending time fasting before the Lord and you know, seeking God out through fast. I don't know why it's gone away, but really fasting, was it really what it is, is that God had given it to the disciples as a way of denying our flesh in, in order that our flesh would become weakened through fast, that we might strengthen the spirit, that we'd be more dependent upon the spirit. And if we would just spend a little bit more time in fasting, I think our spirit would grow because we'd be denying our flesh, actually denying it by not eating that donut or lunch or dinner or whatever it might be. And some people like to think that fasting needs, oh, I got to fast for three, four days, or I got to fast all day. No, no, that's between you and the Lord because, you know, you, whatever it might be that you're fasting is that really the, the significance of it is that you're denying yourself. And you're seeking God, and you're, and you're drawn close to the Lord. And so we see them, how they were drawn close to the Lord at this time. And then, then it tells us, it says, the Holy Spirit said, again, the Holy Spirit speaking to them. And I think it's important because so often we lose sight of the importance of the Holy Spirit was there in the early church. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's very active in the Holy Church, I mean, in the church directing them. He says, separate to me uh, Barnabas and Saul for the works which I have called them. And the, a key, a work that God had given them to do. I've called them to do this work. In verse 3, then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Antioch, of course, where they were, was over by what is known as or Ortus Rivers, about 15 miles where they're going to go from Antioch to Seleucia, and which, which really was the port city there in town. And then they sailed over to Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, and it states how they sent them away. But, of course, we saw how the Holy Spirit was the one that was doing the sending. And the secret of the success of the early church, as I mentioned earlier, is how they were led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was leading them. The Holy Spirit separated Saul and Barnabas, and the Holy Spirit's now directing them. Paul, in this area uh, of Antioch and and known as up the Upper Asia area, he wrote to a letter to the book of Galatia, which was the whole area was known as Galatia. In chapter 3 of the book of Galatians, he says, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? I think it's inter interesting how every great work, every, certainly God, when God begins a good work, and he, he had done, really doing this tremendous work there at Galatians, 
Many churches were being established in that area. As you will go through Acts, we see all these churches that are, that are starting up. They're, they're startup churches, per se. But so often when a great move of the Spirit happens, the church began to grow. And, and unfortunately, it starts to depend less and less on the Holy Spirit and more on their own ability own on the way that they can work things out rather than that dependency upon the Holy Spirit. In other words, when God began, they started to organize. And that always it spells the end of the work when they tried to manage the things that God was wanting to do. Having begun the, the, in the Spirit, the only key to continue revival is what? Is to remain in the Spirit. As we see these things happening, we need to remain in the Spirit. You might say to me, so, well, Pastor Terry, aren't we in the Spirit? How, aren't we doing things being led by the Spirit? And I think we need, always need to examine our own hearts and make sure that we are. And how, are you, how do you know that you're being led of God's Spirit? Well, you've got to go back to the beginning where Jesus says, if you want to be my disciples, what do you have to do? First, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And the ministry that we, God gives us to do is for his glory and not for my glory. And as we examine our hearts and say, Lord, am I really doing this to serve you in order that you might receive the praise? And like, for instance, if people, one or two people, every once in a while, they come up and pat me on the back and they say, oh, my goodness, Pastor Terry, that one really ministered to me. That one thing that I have to make sure I examine, am I receiving the glory or else am I passing that glory unto God? And as, as I examine my own heart and, and, and I say, Lord, would you please fill me this day? There's that humbleness as God breaks your heart and say, Lord, I need you. And so often that dissipates out of the church. But what we'll see is the power, the real power in Paul's life as we move forward is the fact that he was a man that was full of the Holy Spirit. We've seen it in Stephen. We've seen it in Philip. We've seen it all the way through the book of Acts so far. There were men and women who were filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think, unfortunately, there's many people who will still say that they're, they're being led of God's Spirit, they're doing the work of God, but when they, if they would truly examine their self, their motivation would not be for that to please God. In verse 5, he says, When they arrive in Salamis and they preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, they also had John as their assistant. This John that they're talking about here is John Mark. You remember Mark as we know him as a young boy. He grew up and he was around. Uh, you know, his mother Mary was there. They had church at her house there. And now he's moving along, hanging out with uh, Barnabas and Paul as they're tra traveling along. But th when they would arrive in the city, of course, the first thing they would go is to find some friends. They're basically people that they could associate with. And they would go first to the synagogue and they would get that opportunity to preach Jesus to them and when they had gone through the island of Pappas and of course what we see here is Barnabas as they went to Cyprus that Barnabas was from Cyprus and the thought is that Barnabas probably still had relatives living there. And as they were going through this whole island, they were you know, probably saying, Hi, Barnabas, and they were greeting people. And they, Paul and Barnabas, who was using this opportunity to share the gospel uh, with the people that they knew and the opportunities that God gives them. You know, this week, maybe that'll be a week for you when you meet family and friends or talk to people or relatives that you'll be able to say, they, you know, I love it when people come up and say to me, so how you doing? Oh, <laughs> let me tell you. Or nowadays, they don't want to ask me that question because they know that I'll be wanting to tell them how good life is. It is good. Do I have aches and pains? Yeah, just like everybody else has aches and pains. But my goodness, to walk with Jesus, to live for Jesus, and to know his presence. It's an awesome story. And so that's the same story 
that these guys were sharing on this island so long ago as they were traveling there in the area of Cyprus. And of course, Cyprus was a Roman province at that time. It was known for their copper mines. There was a shipbuilding uh, industry that they had there. It had perfect climate. And Pappas, that was says right there at the end of verse 7, was the capital of Cyprus, located on the far end of the island. So they were probably traveling from east to west, the whole length of it, and they finally get to the capital. In verse 6, it tells us that when they got there, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul. Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So we're already starting to get a little drama here as soon as they arrive on the island. We read that Sergius Paulus was an intelligent man, meaning he had a sound understanding. Yet he surrounded himself with this false prophet with him, a sorcerer who was by, by name. It's quite common, as you see, as you look at history, even to the day, the type of counsel that men surround themselves, especially men in power. And this guy, you know, a lot of times they would seek counsel of psychic, with people who have psychic power or uh, they had the, you know, dabbled in the dark arts or, or foreign arts, per se. And the news had spread throughout Cyprus that there was these two men walking up through Cyprus who were preaching Jesus, telling them about another God. And, and they were called to go tell this emperor of the land or the, uh, about Jesus. And, of course, that threatened the sorcerer, of course, didn't it? Because he was the main guy giving a counsel to this man, and they, he felt that he was threatened, so he didn't want him to hear the word of God. Sergius Paulus was open. He wanted to hear the things of God, but yet this sorcerer was wanting to stop it. I think it's, it's a story that we've seen throughout the Gospels, all the way through the Old Testament as we study in the book of Esther on Sunday nights that we'll be back to next Sunday night, of course, how, you know, there was try, always trying to stop the Jews and from, you know, even living at that time. And when we get to the Gospel, how much was the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Herodians and everybody was start, trying to stop Jesus. Even here, this sorcerer was trying to stop Paul and Barnabas for preaching. Jesus and don't let him get to, to the boss guy. Don't let him get to the king. Don't let him get to Sergius Paulus as he might be converted. If he gets converted, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my money? And he's no longer going to use me. And so he sought to, to stop him. Verse 8, but Elimas, the sorcerer, uh, for so he, his name was translated, withstood him, seeking to turn the proconsul's away from the faith. Of course, his real name, as they knew him on the island, was Elamas. He had no intention to allow Sergius Paulus to turn from the dependence upon him to a dependence upon God. That shouldn't stop us from sharing the word of God. Men, especially men of evil, have their own agenda. And they understand, so they might not understand exactly what you're saying, but they understand that you're a threat to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. How people need to hear the word of God. And a lot of times people are so lost and they don't know where to turn. They don't know, they feel hopelessness. I shared with this on Thursday night, and I think I should share it again with you guys. We have some friends that come to Monday Night Study every so often, and they came the other night, and they were sharing a story, a great story. It, uh, out of San Diego, they go down to minister on the streets in San Diego, a, a fellow named Mike and another fellow named Kevin. And they, they got down there, and they said, hey, let's go share with the, the homeless down there. And we think we have a few homeless in Orange County. We don't have homeless like they have now in San Diego. It is so thick in downtown. It's take, taken over the streets with the homeless, the needles, the, the prostitutes, everything. It's like it got cleaned up a few years ago. Now it's back being so terrible once again. 
And so they do have community outreaches. They try to do things and, and all that. And, and so Mike and Kevin said, well, we're to go out there and share the gospel. Well, we like to feed people. So let's stop at Jack in a Box and let's buy that place out of tacos. So they got bags of tacos. They ordered them up. And we're just going to go hand them out and share the word with them. And as they came walking out of uh, Jack in the Box there, there was this man standing outside of his vehicle, and he, they could see in his vehicle was his wife and the kids in the back seat. And they just say, hey, what's going on? You know, lead in question. He says, well, we're homeless and we're living out of our, our car now. And he says, are, and they asked, I said, are you guys hungry? And they said, yeah, we haven't eaten. And so they, they figured out, well, I guess we know where those tacos are going to go, right? And so they got the kids, got four tacos for every kid and, and for the parents and everything. They went in, grabbed a bunch of water bottles and everything and gave, to, gave it to them. And they laid their hands and they prayed with the, the, the whole family to receive the Lord. And it was a marvelous thing. But what they were saying is that no matter what's going on in the city, it's not going to stop us from preaching the gospel. So I asked them, I go, what's the main thing that we as a church, because we as Agape Chapel, we're away up in Orange County, and I think it troubles all of our hearts when we see the homeless, we see it rampant around our streets. What could we be doing? And they've been doing this for quite a long time. And they go, well, it's not so much the food trucks or the clothing, even though they need that and the good works that you could do. He says, there's a spiritual darkness that's kind of, hovers around that encampment in San Diego, and it needs to be broken. The only way it could be broken is through prayer. As the churches, if we join arms and we pray for the spiritual wickedness that's going on in order that the gospel might clean that city out. You know, and I thought about that as we're looking at this story of this sorcerer. See, there was a spiritual darkness that wanted to keep keep uh, Sergius Paulus entrapped. He wanted to keep underneath his control. He says, I, I'm afraid that they're going to listen to you, you know, you two guys about your God rather than listen to me anymore. And what it takes, it takes the gospel to set and break, break the chains of darkness. And verse 9 says, Then Saul, who's also called Paul. This is, notice, this is the first time that he's called Paul. You ever wonder why he was, his name was switched from Saul to Paul? Well, Saul in the, in the Hebrew meant anointed one, but in Rome it meant little guy, little one. It's kind of interesting. And a lot of times people, because his ministry was really to the Gentiles, that his name was changed to Paul. But it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he looked intently at him. I love those qualifying words, words with such potential, as I mentioned earlier, filled with the Holy Spirit. And again, if you would ask me, Pastor Terry, how do I know that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? How can I be with, filled with the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells you, you have not because you ask not. If we just simply ask by faith, do you think our Heavenly Father is going to give us a stone? Or give us some rotten fish? No, he's going to give you your requests as you wait upon him. Say, Lord, please, would you please fill me with the Holy Spirit? It could happen right here in the sanctuary as we're sharing the word of God. It could be when, when you go home the, the, this afternoon or even tomorrow morning as you wake up for eating too much turkey. You might say, Lord, would you please fill me with the Holy Spirit? I had too much turkey last night. But God sees our heart and he realized that in Paul, it tells us that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, was very precise in his writing. As he's been prompted by the Holy Spirit, as he's been writing the book of Acts, he keeps emphasizing that throughout the book. And we'll continue to see this. And there's a purpose for behind the emphasis that hopefully we as people years later would read this book, would get it, the importance of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. I think it's too much uh, for us to think that we could do it underneath our own, um, <laughs> own strength. As I mentioned, the minister today is passed off as they believe that they're 
led by the Holy Spirit, but in truth, they're, they're ministering in the flesh. There's no middle ground. Either you're filled with the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit, or else you're being led by the flesh. In verse 10, and it said, oh, oh, full, <laughs> or, oh, full of deceit and fraud. I love the way he <laughs> just lays into this guy. It, notice how the last verse, how it says he, Paul looked at him intently. Can you imagine those eyes must have got a hold of this man and just starts saying, oh, full of deceit and fraud. Your son, you, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. And those who walk in darkness, is, this is the truth of what Paul is saying there, enemy of all righteousness. You will not cease preventing the straight ways of the Lord as much as they try, as much as the liberal news and the liberal politics of the day, they will not cause to cease the ways of the Lord. You cannot stop God from working. As you're doing the work of God, you have that, I believe, that boldness of the Holy Spirit is to continue in the things that God has given you. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around uh, uh, see, seeking someone to lead him um, by the hand. Of course, this is an interesting thing that Paul did. You might look at it today, what he had to say wasn't politically correct, but Paul didn't care. He was standing before the Lord. We've seen other people being blinded by God. I already remember that one guy in Luke chapter 1 who didn't believe that his wife Elizabeth was going to be born. And what happened to him when he was in the temple? He was blinded and he came walking out, beckoning with his hands, he said. And he's told the story of uh, uh, what had happened. And, and yet this guy, too, fell the same way where he, was, he had to be wandered around. He accused the surfer, sorcerers of deliberately trying to deceive Sergius Paulus that by practicing his demonic arts, he, by, he himself proved himself to be a child of the devil. People who profit by evil will always be an enemy of the work of God. Uh, they seek to make their money, and that's what he was doing. The, there are those today who object each time we speak negatively about the false prophets who arise up, they'll come up and say to us, well, brother, it's not right for you to judge. I hear that. Who do you think you are to speak up against the false prophets? Shouldn't you just love everybody? I had a grandma one time that was growing up, and she says, you know, we're just supposed to love everybody. And I got, that got grained in my mind, and Oh, yeah, I guess that's what I got to be. I got to be a, I end up being a hippie or something like that. That's what we're supposed to do is love everybody, right? But there wasn't any truth to what they had to say. There was no foundation what we're talking about because men <laughs> left them being just a guy. There's some a problem with sin that's in all of our lives, and, and we, that creates problem. And unfortunately, we're not able to love everybody because they don't necessarily want anything to do with our God, and they don't love us. And so when we see these people come up like this, this false prophets and sorcerers, we need to call them out for what they, who they are and what they're doing. They would like to think and say we ought to be sweet and let everybody love us. If you were a shepherd, think about this. If you were a shepherd over there in Israel someplace, wearing your sandals, probably like what Ray's got on here in the, in the front row, wearing a robe and had your own stick walking around, and you just kind of had your sheep all corralled up someplace, and as you were looking at some other sheep, all of a sudden this old pesky wolf came running around, what would you say? Oh, hey, nice wolf, good to see you. You know, nice to see you that you got one of my lammies in your mouth. Please don't hurt him, but I pray that you wouldn't, you know, eat him. But good to see you, wolfie. No, I know Ray what he would do. He'd grab his big cane and stick or whatever, beat that poor old wolf right down to a pulp. And that's what Paul did. He looked at him intently. He looked him straight on. He says, what you're doing is Wrong. And notice the good news in verse 12 for Paul saying this. He says, Then the proconsul 
believe. Don't you love this? It said, this man wasn't able to stop the message from going forth. And when he saw that he, uh, what he had done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord, he said, wasn't the teaching of Paul? Do you hear the, this? I like this. It was a teaching of the Lord. It, he was able to see past Paul and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through Paul as he heard the word of the Lord. Now, when Paul and the party set, uh, set sail from Pampas and came to Perga, the Pamphylia, and John Mark departed from them, and return to Jerusalem. We're going to continue in this story next week. Of course, John Mark had a little problem. He, uh, Barnabas wanted to go on a second miss, missionary journey with them, and Paul said, no, no, I don't want you to come. But it, later on, uh, it's interesting when Mark joins uh, Paul later on in his life, but the, the contention was so strong between Paul and Barnabas between uh, about having Mark go with them, and again, we don't know what had happened. Um, it did produce two missionary groups. Barnabas went one way, and Paul went another way, and the gospel was spread all that much more. What a glorious day. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer, and then Corey and Ray come and lead us in a closing song. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this great story. Lord, as we, Lord, our hearts are inspired by Paul is a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit. When he saw a difficult situation, he didn't back down from it. He shared the truth of God's word. Lord, I don't know what sets in front of us this week, but I pray that we would be a women and we would be men that, that are filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would proclaim the good news, that we would let the light of Jesus Christ shine from us. Just let it flow naturally. Let it flow by your spirit as we minister your word, Father, as we have the opportunity given to us. But this morning before we head out, I just pray if there's anybody here or anybody watching online that's feeling down in the dumps in any way, that feels discouraged, that you might minister your grace to them, that your Holy Spirit might fill their hearts afresh, that all of us, Lord, we're once again, as we humble ourselves before you and say we can't do it by ourselves, Lord, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand?